You know, the disciples and the murdering women, uh, I think they were in a similar circumstance to us. Everything was an upheaval, everything was thrown into chaos, and uh, they come to today where we have this visit of the murdering women to the holy grave of the Lord. As I was reflecting this week on what the murdering women were doing and what ultimately they did in their lives, I was thinking about um, this time of year and the beauty of it, and we happen to have um, a special opportunity uh, in the rectory by our house. We had, uh, we had two sets of uh, birds that were made nests, one right literally outside of our bedroom window, uh, literally within a hand's length. A, a cardinal family uh, put a nest there. We watched them build the nest and build it up and, uh, and then eventually uh, you know, put eggs in there. Uh, and they sat on the eggs. And there was also a, a robin's nest right above our back door, up high. Uh, and uh, the robins also, uh, this was very bright. Uh, the robins uh, had hatched their eggs and their two flew off in the two days that we were gone. Uh, we came back and there were no babies, no, no baby birds. But the cardinals took their time. And so we got to watch. And this week, we actually got to see uh, the cardinals birth their three. Uh, out of the eggs and watched them each day as they grew and got a little bit bigger and eventually all three of them were standing on the outside of the nest. You know, it was like, it's too crowded in here, we got to get out. And of course, uh, Mama and Papa were constantly flying around and they kind of got used to us because we were right outside the window and we would talk to them and, you know, see them and so they weren't really alarmed by us. But I was just blown away by the, the whole experience, right? Of, of seeing this uh, this family develop and grow, and then the eggs hatch, and then out of the eggs came these beautiful little birds. And then even yesterday, I was able to watch, uh, actually the day before we saw the birds leave the nest, and we didn't see two of them after that, but we did see one, uh, probably the one that stayed in the nest longest, because he was at the edge of the nest, like for the last part of it, and just kind of standing there. I got the place to myself. <laughs> I was amazed at how these birds work and how they act, you know? The, the, the parents were always attentive to them, even after they left the nest. You think, well, when they leave the nest, they don't care about it. No, they literally feed them when they're outside the nest, in the bushes around, they would bring food to them and nourish them as they were, as they were going along. And eventually we saw the one bird uh, fly out of the bush and land in the yard. And I was a little fearful because I was sitting on the back porch and I saw a cat up on the upper part of the uh, property, and I thought, uh-oh, this is gonna be bad news, you know, because the cat was literally watching the whole thing, so the parents were kinda hovering around. And eventually, uh, you know, the cat decided he was gonna come down because he knew something was up. Well, right then I got up, I'm, I'm like, you know, they're my family, you know, so I got up out of the chair and kind of walked out. I said, no, you get out of here. The cat ran off, you know. Uh, but this is really what uh, life as a Christian is about, isn't it? It's about, you know, once we get out of the nest and we're on our own and we're on our, you know, we're out there, we have to have the protection of our parents. And God is our parent. And uh, the mother of God is our parent. And they watch over us and they care for us and they feed us, literally, even after we leave the nest. And I thought this was a great illustration, really, of, of what uh, the murdering women were all about. Because they went there in hope and faith. They went there, and Mary Magdalene especially went there with hope and with a little bit of doubt. And I think that's why when she first saw the Lord as the gardener, she didn't recognize him until he spoke to her. And the father said it's because she had a little bit of doubt still whether or not this was really going to be true. But once she saw him and experienced the Lord, everything changed in her life. And Mary Magdalene, as you'll see on the night today, there's, there's a lot of women here. There are actually a total of uh, seven women. I, I think I've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight women who were at the tomb uh, in various times, but they all came together to anoint the Lord's body, thinking that he was still reposed. This would have been the tradition. But Mary Magdalene had this special relationship. And as you may know, she was one of the first who came to the Lord, and she had demons cast out of her. And she followed the Lord faithfully for all these years. And, you know, we don't hear this in the Gospels, but women were always around the Lord. 
there was always a, a group around. They aren't mentioned in Scripture because women weren't typically mentioned that often. Only in Holy Scripture do we see women even mentioned at all historically, very few. But Mary Magdalene was very special because she had this transformation in her life. And you remember at one point the Lord was uh, being anointed by a, a woman uh, and anointed her his feet with holy oil and there was a controversy over this oil and selling this oil and we see here uh, this initial step which Mary took which was to give Lord the Lord the honor that he so deserved throughout his ministry she was there with him she was right beside him and even at the cross of Christ she was there with the mother of God she was right there at the end she was faithful she was unwilling to give up right? And we see this as we uh, read the text of the church, how faithful Mary was. Well, as it turns out, she was very faithful because from there, after the resurrection, and as she saw the Lord, the Lord departed and, and moved on uh, in his ascension, she went to the, uh, at the time, the emperor Tiberius, and she shared the gospel with him. And what is the gospel but that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead? So what did she do? But she brought... A, an egg with her, a red egg, that we still to this day uh, give out on Pascha Sunday. And she took that red egg and she shared with Tiberius the gospel message through the egg. That the egg itself is a symbol, right, of number one, the Holy Trinity, right? And number two, it's a symbol of resurrection because eggs imply birth, don't they? And when I share with you the story of the eggs that we saw in the nests around our house, we were so reminded of this truth, this truth that God is the God of the living. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God who resurrects, who brings to life. And the world at the time of the Romans was not a place of resurrection. It was a place of death and sacrifice and constant uh, uh, you know, attentiveness to the gods and, and all of these things around them. They had a whole society of this. But it never included any kind of resurrection. It did not include a transformation of life. And I think we even in the resurrection, we see as the Lord depicted in his transfiguration that he would be different. And that when he returned, he would not even be really recognizable as Mary Magdalene found out. She did not notice him. Thought he was the gardener. But the Lord has come to bring resurrection, brothers and sisters. He has come to bring new life. And this was the message that Mary brought to Tiberius. And all of these women actually went on to be great uh, women, of the women of God who loved God and through their various ministries, depending on where they were. Uh, for instance, Joanna, she was the uh, one of the servant's daughters of King Herod. And she, when John the Baptist's head was taken off, she's the one who went and found his head and brought it and, and protected it. So these women were a special relationship with Christ and a special relationship with the church because they led the way. And of course, today we also have in our reading about the deacons being uh, made deacons in the early church. And so we have this parallel between these women who went to the, uh, the tomb of the Lord and also the deacons who served. And both served and both serve. And all of us are called to serve God. The ultimate is to share the gospel with others. And the gospel can be shared through your mouth, through the verbal uh, clarity and verbal expression of what the gospel is, that Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, came to earth, that he taught us the way to live, and then he was brutally killed and buried, and then the third day he rose again. And this for our salvation, because death could not be defeated by us. We could not defeat death on our own. And the Lord came to help us to defeat death. He came to help us to conquer the one thing that we couldn't conquer. That's why Mary Magdalene brought the egg to Tiberius to share with him, to show him this truth, that there is resurrection, that the Holy Trinity is the one who brings resurrection and new life to all of us. And so as we reflect on this, I pray that you can go uh, away from here today and try to let the expression of the gospel, the expression of the resurrection, be part of your life. And it may mean that you share the gospel in your words, but it may mean you also share the gospel, more importantly, in your life and how you live. Are you kind to others? Do you express the virtues in your life when you see others? And do you take the opportunity when it is given to you to share the gospel with others? 
Do you take the opportunity to tell them about your church? To tell them the place where they can come and hear this message? And have their lives transformed and changed? Because this is ultimately the goal, isn't it? It's for our lives to be changed. That we don't stay the same. And throughout our life, we have to renew this. Every Pascha, we renew it again. It comes to life again as we live through the experience of Great and Holy Lent. And then we come to Great and Holy Pascha. And we experience that resurrection. And then throughout the year, we have little moments of this, this new life again. To remind us to come back again to God. To not to be too attached to the world. And to be too stuck on the things of the world. Uh, no matter what it is, sometimes we think that we cannot survive if we don't do X, Y, and Z. And you'll find out that God always gives us grace. He always gives us peace. And he always provides for us a way out of our difficult circumstance. And he's always faithful to us if we are faithful to him. This is what God calls us to. It's a reciprocal experience, right? It's not just God doing all the work and we standing back and watching. Or, nor is it us doing all the work and God not doing anything, as some of the deist fathers would have said. But instead, it's God working together with us. By our obedience, by his faithfulness, and by our faithfulness, we come to a knowledge of who God is, and then we come to a knowledge of who we are as well. Because when we know God, we can know ourselves. We don't know God, it's very difficult to know ourselves. We can be in confusion. Because he's made us and created us in his image and came to be like us, he knows us, he cares for us, he watches us. And his mother and all of the saints care for us and love us. And so as we reflect today on this holy day of honoring the myrrh-bearing women, I pray that you can also be like the myrrh-bearing women and bring the message of the resurrection and the gospel to others in your life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen.